So we have that mic there. I need this other one. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, because what we do is he talks and then I get to Okay, I appreciate that. All right. All right, guys, can everybody hear me? My name is Andrew, and this is Zach. We're with Breakpoint Labs, and we're going to be talking about how to find a company's breakpoint. A little cheesy to names in the, in the title there, but um, what this talk's all about is essentially uh, modern-day hacking, uh, which is very similar to what we see here, right, the, using the force to get in the building. Um, the, re the inspiration for this talk was really similar to the last talk. You know, we, um, when we talk to a lot of people new to penetration testing or interested in it, they always come up and say, you know, so I scan with the vulnerability scanner, right, and then I exploit it with Metasploit and I'm in, right? And the reality is there's a lot more to that, and that was kind of the inspiration for this talk. And I think B-Sides events like this are great because you can share these types of um, introductory material. Um, so if you're a senior pen tester in the room, you're probably not going to be, you're probably going to get bored. But if you're new to this stuff and you're interested in kind of like, you know, some common ways to gain a foothold in a network, you might learn some pretty interesting techniques. This is a quick agenda. I won't go through all this here. But we're going to be covering these topics. Um, who am I? My name is Andrew Nickel. I do, uh, with Zach Myers here, we do Primal Security blog and podcast, as well as work for the Red Team and Breakpoint Labs. Um, in the past, we've spoken at some B-Sides events in RBA Sec. Um, we just got back from B-Sides Jackson, which is a really cool event, um, doing this talk, actually. Um, we're past certification junkies nowadays. We've only spent our time with offensive security certs, really waiting for their web, web hacking course to come online. They always say it's like next year. Um, we love Python, CTFs, learning, and long walks on the beach. Zach actually runs Knapsack, which if, if you're near Annapolis, Maryland, which you're not now, but um, you, can, you can check it out. Yeah, it's a two-hour drive. J Jackson, I think, it was like a 16-hour drive, so yeah. wasn't too bad. So yeah, come out and check us out. We're just a monthly meetup on meetup.com. So things have changed since the 90s, right, guys? In the 90s, you know, in the, in the 90s, we got in with, like, social engineering, Social engineering, yeah, so, social engineering and weak passwords. And now we get in with social engineering and weak passwords. <laughs> Not a whole lot's changed, right? Maybe USB keys instead of floppies. But um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's just a little there, a joke there. But um, the goal, like I said, is to break the scan and exploit uh, mentality, um, just to show that there's a lot more to it. And we're going to do that by covering some examples. We're not going to dive quite as deep into phishing as the last presenter. Really cool talk. Um, that was awesome. But we are going to cover like phishing, since that's one of our most common techniques, just at a higher level. Then we're going to walk through web application vulnerabilities since we all love them. Uh, we're going to talk about multicast name resolution poisoning, uh, SMS and B relay attacks, which is fun to mess with phone scanners, uh, and then the account compromise, which is inevitable on every test. So uh, just a high-level methodology. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but this is a generally our methodology. One, one of the things we see with our customers is a focus on, like, so scan us. Scan it, right? Run your tools, right? So we like to break out just for our customer level at a high level automated testing and manual testing, and it helps our customers understand, hey, these guys are actually doing more than clicking the scan button. And that seems to be a challenge we face all the time, is that we're not just running these scan tools. There's a lot more behind the scenes um, that has to go on, and it can help justify you know, why it might take a certain time to do, do a bit of work. Um, and then the other question I get a lot of times from uh, people interested in pen testing or just getting started is, uh, how do we go beyond a scan? So I, I've, you know, if you've ever done OSCP, uh, doing the lab course, if, you, if you're, you're new to pen testing, you get in the labs, you're inevitably going to run all your NSC scripts, run, run, run whatever you have, and you're like, I've got all this data, but now what do I do? And you're looking at it, you don't know where to go next. You've popped some of the quick MS0867 boxes, and you don't know where to go next. Well, the first thing is get ready to fail, right? So one of the, that's the first thing I tell people new to pen testing is it's a lot about, it's a lot of fail. You get a lot of wins, especially as you get better, but, um, you know, you fail a lot. I, at least I tend to. Um, and then it's all about recon and mapping, so finding the systems and content that others have missed. Um, that can go a long way. So as the last presenter talked about Shodan, and, and there's also Census. Those are really great tools um, from an external perspective to do some neat, quick, quick and dirty recon. Um, but there's also automated, like I mentioned, automated testing, run the right tool for the job. And this gets more and more important when we talk about web technologies. So you can run your, your you could run uh, Burp Suite Professional or even WebInspect against the WordPress server, but you might find a lot more uh, cool vulnerabilities using WP Scan, for example. So understand what the tools you're running or scripts you're running are good at and run the appropriate tool. And then um, the bread and butter is manual testing, you know, figuring out all the areas of user input. And a lot of this is very uh, heavy on web, but understand where how your input's being leveraged and fuzz appropriately. Um, and then research all version-specific vulnerabilities and then try to combine findings. And we've got some examples we're going to walk through um, for that. 
And the final stage here is reporting. We like to highlight business impact. One of the qu uh, questions I'll ask my customers, you know, what keeps you up at night? What is the biggest fear? Our pen test we're on right now, that, that the biggest fear is availability. So when we, when we pop some uh, sensitive uh, stuff in their network that could let us take the power down, they're like, oh, that's, the, that's my biggest risk. But to us, we got domain admin, we're like, that's your biggest risk. But to them, it's, it's different. You know, so the path to domain admin wasn't as important as taking the power down to the building. So, you know, it all depends on, you know, what, what your customer's risk level is, risk threshold, and understand that because it'll help you shape your results. So as the last presenter showed, phishing works, and I'm sure there's no surprise here, right? So nobody in here I have to convince that. Phishing is a, is a great uh, way to gain a uh, foothold into a network. Um, but this is more from a high-level business perspective, how to, go out, how, how to go about doing a phishing um, engagement, at least how we do it. So first it starts with planning. Um, if you are allowed to get code execution and do all that fun stuff, that's great. But you might not always be. Sometimes the customers, especially if they're brand new to pen tests, they've never done it. Um, they may just need um, a click analysis, see how many users would click to drive that situational awareness and education. Sometimes you might just be gathering credentials. You may not always be doing the fun code execution. It all comes down to determining that rules of engagement with your customer and figuring out what ultimately they want uh, the goals for the assessment. And then I like to determine the scenario. So this helps drive home awareness. And with our engagements, we commonly do two types of scenarios. Either we'll, we'll uh, replicate a common uh, ransomware attack or, or malware threat, which is obviously going to look bad with the domain choices. And uh, it's going to maybe use like a UPS tracker kind of thing. Like, uh, you, you, you know, here's a shipment uh, to pick up. Click this link. That would actually probably work pretty well right now over the holidays. Or we may go targeted attack, which is cloning the OWA or something of that nature for the, for the organization. And then determining your phishing domain, which is key, as uh, we saw in the last presentation, you know, you um, need to make sure that you've uh, done some homework with your with spam filters and web content filters. You can actually submit your domains to web content filters like Blue Code. You can submit your domain to be trusted as them. It usually takes about 24 hours, and you can get your domain trusted. What I usually like to do, um, from more of like a white box perspective, I'll have a POC for the site, and I'll test my domain with them before we fire it out, you know, to all the users. Um, it all depends on, you know, the particular engagement and the, and, and the type of communication you've established. And the last thing is uh, email spoofing vulnerabilities. You know, figure out if, you, they, if, you, if they do have them. Um, they may not work, but it's important to test for them and leverage them if you can. Um, all too often you'll see these types of vulnerabilities in place. A good example of these vulnerabilities is Google Apps for Work. If anybody's using Google Apps for Work and hasn't set up the SPF and DKIM records, you're vulnerable out of the box, and they don't do a good job at necessarily holding your hand through that process. If I find an organization using Google Apps for Work, um, nine times out of ten, I can spoof through them. Um, and people trust Google's uh, email server, so it's uh, something to think about. Um, and you execute the engagement. We do have a full blog post there at a blog if you want to check it out, so I'm not going to uh, go through everything here. But um, we like to send email with Python. Uh, it's just, you know, we've, uh, we've used some of the um, more larger scale tools. There's Lucy, there's a bunch of free open source tools and, and paid for tools. Uh, we do it on the cheap with Python just because. Uh, it's cheap and it works. Um, and Lucy, I found, like some of the other tools we found, call, got caught by the spam filters, especially with their click analysis links, because they build a really ugly URL, uh, URL to see who clicked it. And with Python, you have the flexibility to create your own link to check your like access logs to see who clicked the link, depending on how you're doing it. But like I said, three general ways we do it. Click analysis, uh, credential gathering, or executing code. Um, three common ways uh, we leverage phishing. And then, the, you know, inevitably, the, the CEO's reaction to... Um, Opening the email is pretty bad, but usually it's the IT admin we get. The CEO, for some reason, if you work out if you if you work the scope out with the customer beforehand, for political reasons, the CEO's email generally doesn't fall on that list. But um, you know, the IT admin does, and they're always great targets because they generally have elevated privileges. That's always great. I actually had a situation once where we we fished the admin, we got on site, and our POC for the customer said, like, gave the admin a hard time. He's like, man, you, you clicked their link and, and and logged in, and I was like, yeah, sorry, I did. Uh, I'm the bad guy, right? But um, he didn't change his passwords and stuff, so we were like domain admin still in domain one. I mean, we even told him, but it's all good. Uh, he changed his password at the end. This is a higher level view of like what we do from the, when, I, when I talk about the campaign. So on the, on the left, you see the um, common uh, malware, ransomware. And, um, you know, it, this was actually just a hyperlinked image. Um, I get a lot of success with that, like the last presenter said, the, just, just a, literally an href image, the whole thing. Um, and if they click anywhere on the image, it'll open up and you get your click analysis. And the right might be just a, um, you take the company, figure out where is a legitimate login for them, and then you try to mimic that login as closely as possible. And this is just an HTTP basic authentication prompt, um, cheap and dirty. 
Um, I already mentioned the fishing domain stuff, um, but you know, you, I like to use one that closely matches the target. You may want to uh, register the domain in advance and throw some legit content up there if you have time um, to get categorized appropriately. Maybe try to uh, submit your domain to their web proxy if they if they allow their web content filter if they allow that. Um, and then you know, you may have uh, domains that you know ups dash hyphen track package tracker dot com um, that kind of thing. But it's it's important to test before you start to fire off for hundreds of emails. You might. Uh, might get to your targets and blow your blow your cover in the in the link strip. Just important to test if you can. And on the slide here, if you've never done any email spoofing vulnerabilities or tried to forge headers, it's actually really easy. And this is the steps this is the steps you can follow. And you'll have to do variations of these steps because you may be able to forge um, headers in step three, but um, or maybe not be able to forge headers in step three, but you might be able to forge them in step four. Um, essentially, what we're doing here is step uh, one: we're determining the mail servers. Two: we're connecting to the servers, and this is a uh, my domain. Um, and step three, you'll forge the header, uh, and then step four, you actually forge the email. So in step three, that's what the uh, mail servers will uh, use, and step four, that's what's going to be presented in the Outlook client. They don't have to match. Uh, and variations of this might get through, so you may, um, I usually do some email spoof testing with my point of contact, and just play around with some email, email, see what he gets, see what they look like before we decide how, you know, what vulnerabilities are there and what we want to use across the board for his organization. And these slides, by the way, are already on SlideShare, um, so you don't have to, like, memorize or take pictures, they're already up. Um, but that last email, that's kind of what it would look like in an Outlook client. You know, I like to do immediate password changes uh, required. Again, a sense of urgency, right? You're going to lose your email. That's always very effective, and they'll click and give me creds or uh, click the link or we can execute code, whatever the rules of engagement are allowed there. But um, this is an example. As you can see, Outlook presents it cleanly. It looks like help desk support, but in reality, it was coming from Gmail. Um, just an interesting, sneaky little technique because, you know, users don't usually inspect headers. Uh, and again, just another look at the, the possible scenarios, the click analysis. Um, we talked about that, creating a unique link with Python. We usually do a credential gathering. So you can use uh, Social Engineering Toolkit, which is great, by Dave Kennedy. Um, does a lot of the, the, the footwork for you if you want to run your own little code. PHP snippets are good, if, especially if they're using basic authentication. Uh, and then code execution, uh, Empire is great for that. And the last talk did a great overview of that. There's a lot of talks online. We'll spend a lot of time there on that, but it's a great tool for generating your payloads. Now moving into something very near and dear to my heart, that is web application vulnerabilities. Um, I, I love them and hate them. They're everywhere, um, but they are a lot of fun, and they tend to be a way that we can establish a foothold in the organization, at least in the last two pen tests this month, uh, month and a half, we've gotten into the organization through the web application, um, which is great. Um, and the way we do that is, well, first we, um, like I mentioned, find the content that others have missed. So unlinked content enumeration is, is key. And we're going to show an example where that, uh, in, the, in the next slide, we're going to walk you through enumerating that and exploiting it. Um, but in this slide, we see uh, generally uh, how your input's being used um, and then how you might test what, what vulnerabilities are, are, th are there. So figuring out how your, your application's leveraging your input and then fuzzing appropriately um, can go a long way beyond just the, your Acunetics web inspect work suite, that kind of thing. So as your input landing on the screen, for example, you may want to try to test for XSS. That might be you know, useful because maybe you can use an XSS payload in your phishing campaign, right? So that's kind of neat. Um, is your input calling on stored data, maybe like a search query or what have you, SQL injection? Um, all these here, I won't go through them all, but it's important to take a step back and maybe make a mind map of the application saying, what is the application allowing me to do? Is it let me upload a file for an avatar? Um, and then how is the input being leveraged? And then try to fuzz appropriately. SecList has a lot of good fuzz lists, fuzzdb. Those kind of things can help you use these pre-built lists if you're unfamiliar. But now we're going to talk about file inclusion to code execution because this is the, if you're not familiar with this, this is the go-to way to pick up a significant other at a bar, right? Go up to them, hey, you know, how do you massage file inclusion to shell, uh, exit code execution? Like, oh, man, it will work on me. But um, <laughs> so sometimes file inclusion can lead to code execution. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just like catting it to the screen, which is not as fun. But we're going to talk about a, um, a, 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 a remote file inclusion example um, because I think a lot of times your vulnerability scanner will point this out. They may find that, hey, there's RFI here, but they're not going to show you how to like put the pieces together to spawn a shell or get, you know, automate your RCE. So in the example of code execution, you may have like a PHP include statement, and this is going to potentially lead to code execution versus a PHP echo it might just, you know, catch the screen. So this is an example of how sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. LFIs take a little normally a little more work. You gotta figure out where your input's uh, being tossed on the on the um, system and try to include that input. Um, and a lot of times it's like log poisoning, which is a little harder than it was in the past. RFIs are a lot more fun because you can point them back to a remote server and run code from that server, which is great. So now we're going to walk through a scenario I had on a pen test in the past, and uh, it was awesome because it uh, got us domain admin from the internet, which is great. Um, it all came about from 
a resource called debug.php. Um, I got an HT, HTTP 200 OK. So what I was actually doing was I pulled up Burps Intruder, and I was just running through um, Rathless, uh, and I was just, you know, trying to check out what content the web server doesn't want me to know about, right? That's not linked in the application, not necessarily something you're going to find on your spider. And I found debug.php, and it gave me a 200 OK with a blank screen. And I'm sitting there like, all right, well, great, right? So what's next? I see just blank screen. Is this just, this is it? Um, and with PHP code, since it's, you know, server-side code, you're not going to see the code, so you don't know what's actually happening. So the next thing I did was try to figure out inputs, right? Because I want to see if I can send parameters to this uh, resource. Does it do something different? Um, uh, so essentially, I went to lunch. Uh, it never underestimates the power of good lunch. I started another burp intruder, um, and I was, I was actually going through parameters and the get parameters. And then I uh, just went to lunch, came back, and I was inspecting my intruder window, and I saw something really cool that made me get really excited and almost break my keyboard. Um, so if we look in the window, which is hard to see on the screen here, You'll see that there's a length, everything else is 193. So everything's basically that blank page. And except when we get to page equals test, you get 633 uh, or whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, man. So you can sort by length, response length. I am burped to see this. And if you see on the screen here, attempting to bug test, so it's got my page equals test. Um, there's cross-site scripting there, right? But that's, that's boring in, in this instance, because it also says warning include test, right? So we talked about that PHP include. So I'm getting really excited because it looks as if my input's being leverage in an include statement in, in an insecure manner. So I'll test for local file inclusion, right, directory traversal up, Etsy password, all the good stuff. But more importantly, I'll test for RFI and see if I can snag, um, get to run some code. So in step one, that's the request from Burp, um, pointing it back to my bad boy box. Uh, step two is actually just a Python simple HTTP server. Um, and uh, it's grabbing code for me, which is a great way to get a little web server up if, uh, in a pen test. And uh, that 1.php actually is the, just a system ID command. In step three, you see the output, which is awesome. Um, so we're actually getting code execution in this debug.php that had been there for like 15 years, and nobody really cared. It had gone through a bunch of pen tests, but you know, it's just one of those things that got overlooked because the automated tool didn't find it. Now, at, at this point, I automated it with Python. All I'm doing in the back end here is using uh, Python's request module and just making these web requests and then grabbing my input with raw input and just shoveling into the server to run. Uh, and I, it feels like a shell. I do this a lot. They always make fun of me, you fake shells. But um, I, it, this is a, in this instance, in real life, it was on a Windows system running, a Windows box running a system, so it was just glorious at that point. Um, anytime you see PHP running on Windows, I get excited. Uh, and, and that's it. That's the web application portion. Does that pass it over here, Zach? Thanks, Andrew. All right, so the third common way we like to get on your network is multicast name resolution poisoning. And if you're not familiar with this, Essentially, a majority of the time, internal networks, when DNS fails, it relies on a, se a series of different protocols to try and resolve these issues, and in Windows environments especially. So you'll see this enabled a lot, and these protocols are called LLMNR, Link Local Multicast Name Resolution. Uh, Andrew likes to call it Limner for short. Limner. Uh, NetBIOS, um, and multicast DNS. So you'll see a lot of this traffic going on, and there's a lot of ways we can do this, but I'm going to go explain a tool that's like the go-to tool I start usually in every pen test as soon as I arrive on the scene if I have network connectivity. But by listening and intercepting and manipulating this traffic, we can essentially redirect authentication and potentially capture hashes, see clear text, things that are going on, and even man in the middle some traffic. So how do we do this? We use a tool called Responder. Responder is like the Wreck-It Ralph of internal pen testing in my opinion. Um, essentially, it's just going to wreck your network, and a lot of times I've seen this admins are like, what the hell are you talking about with LLM and R? So we have to kind of really explain it a little bit. Uh, simply, Responder is a Python script that was created by, I believe, Spider Labs, and it's, it's going to basically try and aid in the abuse of these multicast protocols and poisoning them. It also, if you give it just a switch H, it simply can just do a lot of other different things, but one of them is WPAT spoofing, where it's going to take that web proxy auto discovery feature. A lot of times in IE it's enabled, and we'll go over that in a little bit in another use case. Um, you can abuse that and capture some HTTP creds um, or things that are going on in web traffic. But like I said, it does man-in-the-middle attacks where it can intercept credentials being exchanged, and this can lead to that pass the hash potentially if it's really old, like a different thing with the picture you're capturing. Uh, password cracking, or even SMB relay attacks, which we're going to cover in our fourth example. Um, but by, by default, out of, off the bat, Responder starts in its config file a slew of different rogue services. As you can see up here, there's a lot of different protocols and services it starts. 
to try and capture all this different traffic that you can abuse a man in the middle. So our first use case is just a simple one. We, sit, we just simply start responder. Um, we give it the interface that we want it to listen on on the network. Uh, just an easier here. And if we just give it a switch F, we're doing a fingerprint. And fingerprint is essentially just going to try and see on the network, am I seeing this traffic? And can I get some information about maybe the OS, maybe the host name, things of that nature. And from there, can I also capture some of these hashes? Are they being passed across the network, these authentication attempts? And as we can see here, we've captured an NTLM v2 hash. And with this, we'll get into it, but you can SMB relay attack this more than likely, and it's for an administrator. The second use case is WPAT. So we can do this by pointing at the interface once again. If we do a switch B and W, we're enabling WPAD, um, and we're also enabling basic authentication. So when a user tries to open, they basically click on IE right, they're trying to go to the internet, and when they do that, they get prompted right here. And majority of the time, users will just go, oh, Windows is prompting me for my creds. I'll just enter it in real quick. It happens a lot. Mindlessly doing that, they enter it in, and it sends to us because we created a malicious WPAD server that is basically listening and saying, I'm the WPAD server. You know, when, if, you, if you go out to the internet, check with me first, and then, you know, send me your crets. And we basically can do that by creating a WPAD.dat file with just that switch W. And if you can't really probe aggressively, just listen on the network. See if the traffic is even going on and analyze it. Um, so if you want to just prove to the point that, like, hey, I could actually probably attack this or use it to exploit your network, and that's maybe not in play, just do a switch A. And that's going to analyze the network and see if you have any of this type of traffic going on or WPAD requests you know, going back and forth in the network. And it can really give you some kind of teeth to your report if you, know, you can't exploit. So how do we prevent this? One way to prevent it is essentially disabling these protocols. They're useful, but they can be abused. And we don't absolutely need them, but they are, you know, they are helpful. Um, if you have a lot of hosts in your Windows environment, it can be pushed out with a group policy to just disable the multicast uh, protocols. We can also enter a WPAD file entry in the DNS, so that way it won't be broadcasting, hey, where's the WPAD? And it will be right in your DNS record, so that can't be abused either. We can segment the local networks with more you know, VLAN entries to try and prevent uh, the impact. And we can also ensure that NTLM v2 is like the top tier being used rather than we can't downgrade to Landman or NTLM v1. So with that, the fourth common way that we usually attack your network is SMB relay attacks. So like I showed in the first use case, we captured an NTLM v2 hash and for the administrative user. And with that, basically now we can try and relay this, these uh, credentials that we captured from the challenge and response protocol exchange. And we can then say, all right, I'm going to start a malicious HTTP or SMB row service. And from there, I can try and relay that and log into their box and get code execution. And that can call, be caused from this LLMNR or MBNS spoofing that you'll get from responder. Or it could even be caused from automated processes. And that could be just things that are authenticating across the network. And you don't really think about it, but if there's no agent installed and they're just spraying creds across the network to try and authenticate to the box and do something like a task or update or patch management or even a vuln scan, you know, that's happening on your network and we can abuse that. And it's for good, but we can, as attackers, use it for bad. So every time I come on the scene, right, as a red teamer, Andrew and I come in all happy, you know, we're like, all right, we're here to help you. Well, we are. But the blue team freaks out and they're like, we got to patch everything. We have to make sure everything's configured. We don't want to look bad because every, it's always a game of cat and mouse, you know, and everyone thinks that we're there to just abuse everything, but we're not. So the blue team runs Nessus, right? As soon as they run Nessus, I've got Responder running essentially. Maybe I have an SMB relay tool running as well. And let's say I'm targeting a host on the network. Well, when it's say, if there's no agent installed, the Nessus scanner is going to try and do an authenticated scan more times than less. And it's going to basically try and authenticate through SMB. And I could essentially just man the middle attack this and then gain code execution. But I'm going to explain this a little bit further in a lab environment that you guys can kind of follow along with in, a, in an example in a second. So just to kind of give a high level perspective, the attacker box, my Kali instance, is that 103, the domain controller 
is the dot 105. Oh, sorry. The domain controller is the dot 102. And the thing we're targeting in the Windows client is the dot 105. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create an MSF Venom. I'm going to create my malicious binary. I'm going to say I want to make a interpreter reverse shell, point it back to my Kali instance, and I created matures1.exe, as you can see. From there, I'm going to use my multi-handler, and I'm going to set that up, the same exact configuration I did with that binary, make sure everything's clicking. And I'm also going to set the auto-run script option. So that way, if this all works and pans out like I want it to, I will be able to migrate to a more steady service and not lose my connection. So make sure you kind of set all these little perfect variables up. From there, I'm going to open another terminal, and I'm going to use smbrelayx.py. This is by Core Security. You can also use something in Responder or other different, you know, modules or things like that in Metasploit. But I like to use smbrelayx.py. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to point that at my target, which is that Windows client I'm targeting. And I'm going to point it at that binary I created. And essentially from there, I then switch to my other VM, my domain controller. And I'm just going to say, hey, I just want to do a quick dir listing on that target. And by there, it's making a request. It's sending that, those, that authentication to that client. And from there, because of that traffic going on, I'm capturing the, that hash. And I'm basically saying, NTLMv2, authenticate. And now I've basically gotten a interpreter shell on that Windows client I was targeting. So I've essentially abused the, the resolution of trying to say, where, you know, can I get to this server? Can I list this directory? And I've abused that authentication process, and now I have access to the ship, to the box. Now, from a, another perspective in a lab, you could just get the free version of Nessus and do the same thing. You start your SMB relay. You also start the same process with the multi-handler, and you start a scan. And you're going after that target that we're targeting. And in the scan process, it tries to authenticate, and we can do the same exact process. So it doesn't always have to be from the multicast name resolution. It can also be from these automated scripts and these automated tools sending authentication across the network. So how do we prevent these SMB relay attacks? The real way to truly prevent it is to require SMB signing, but that can break a lot of things in your, uh, in your network, especially with, um, you know, Samba and Linux hosts and things of that nature. But essentially what we're doing when we do SMB sign is we're just digitally signing at the packet level and we're confirming the origin and the authenticity of it. Um, we could also, once again, disable those protocols. We can create that WPAD entry in our DNS. We can just prevent SMB traffic outbound, which you should be doing uh, all together. And we can enable uh, EPA, the extended protection and authentication for Windows systems, and that's just adding icing on the cake to the authentication process. All right, so this is near and dear to my heart and real life people. If you ever do an internal pen test <clears throat> and physical is on the table, and you can snoop around and look at people's desks and just see if sticky notes are there. They're there. Notebooks are there. Things are in the open, and people are just, by nature, we have so many different things we are logged into and so many different accounts and so many different things all the time. It, it, plain as day, sometimes it'll be for internal apps, and they'll just say, here's my username and here's my password, and they're usually not that complicated if your company doesn't have a policy in place. So I'm going to explain to you the fifth way that we commonly get into your internal network, you know, and exploit your network. Essentially, if you run a, a, like any kind of vulnerability scanner, it'll find these things. It'll find username enumeration, potentially, lack of automation controls, which means I can brute force and knock on the door all day, and lack of password complexity. And I'll say these are all low findings. But what we can do is we can piece together these, these things and create that perfect storm to give us that account compromise and truly show what we can do from there. And I'm going to explain potential ways you could do that. So username enumeration. A lot of times, password reset features, and we'll see this a lot with applications, it'll say, you know, you'll enter in something, but it'll say email address not found. Well, if it did find something, it'll say, I just sent you an email. So now we can gather that, put it in our list. We have that user or that potential email. Login error messages. A lot of times, this is really hard to do. If you enter in a username and it says invalid, and if you enter in, you know, Zach2, and I entered Zach1 first, and Zach2 says, you know, username found, or something of that nature in the error message, because it's just trying to be verbose, you can abuse that feature and collect usernames. Contact us. I've seen it where I had a drop-down list once, and it said, which admin do you want to contact? 
out of these four. And I'm like, holy crap, now I have all four admins usernames for this and if they, yeah, I could just brute force all day, hopefully. Um, timing. Sometimes in Burp, when you use Intruder, you'll see, you, you can rely usually on the content length and the status code to really tell you if you've gotten in it at all when you're doing your brute force attempts or if there's any anomalies. But look at the timing. Sometimes the timing can also give it away. If you've got maybe a valid thing, it'll take, you know, 15 seconds to process, while if it's invalid, it's, you know, less than a second. So kind of keep that in mind. Username, user registration. This is also really hard too, and it, it, there's not too many ways around this, but it'll tell you that username already exists because you want that username. It already exists in the database. It can't be used. Well, now I know that's valid as well. There's a lot of things you can also look for. Sometimes there's Easter eggs in the client side source code and applications. Uh, various error messages will give you a lot of different things. Uh, you can use Google hacking and OSINT, like uh, the previous talk said. There's a lot of different things with the harvester, and you can use, you know, Recon NG to really up your game with trying to get the usernames. And sometimes the application just flat up tells you PHP bulletin board is guilty of this. In the bottom right corner, it'll tell you who logged in last. Um, WordPress is bad at this. It tells you in the comments. It tells you in the source code. The author parameter. I mean, there's just countless things that you can do to really uh, enumerate these usernames. So once you gather these usernames, let's move to step two. Step two, logins. Whether it's an application login or a service login. Um, I'm going to talk application here, but we basically pull up that request, and we're going to try it in Burp's repeater a few times manually. We're just going to say, all right, I know Bob1 is a user, and I'm going to just enter in password and maybe variations of password to see if it works. If I do it five to 10 to 15 times, and I get no like message like your account's locked or something's gone, I'm going to keep knocking on the door because more than likely our account lockout is not there. Um, so if there's no sign of automation controls, send that from repeater to intruder and let's make this an automated process. A lot of times if you have a CAPTCHA that can thwart this or the I am not a robot, a lot of people are starting to see that more and more with the checkbox or like all those damn images where it's like, is this a railroad? Is that a railroad? Okay. You know, and basically, one thing to always not overlook, if you're looking at an application, maybe the main login is strong, but maybe their like mobile or their API doesn't have the same settings. So maybe you can brute force those and use the same, you know, usernames and different things of that nature to try and get into that interface. And last, as we know, humans were bad at passwords. We're terrible, unfortunately, unless you're in security. And, and if your company doesn't have, yeah, Andrew's still bad. If you, <laughs> If you don't have policies in place with your company or your organization, uh, more times than less, we're going to really just choose something simple, whether it's a relative's name, our dog's name, our favorite football team. Um, or I've seen it where people use their username as their password, where they use variations of password. The month of the year, we just saw that sticky note. I kind of changed the month and the year, but that was on a sticky note I saw, because um, I don't want to get in trouble. The company name and year, keyboard walks, people think they're being tricky. They're not. They're there's tons of lists out there with the keyboard walks and variations of it and the length. So up your game with that. And, and, and you know, weak passwords are just inevitable, especially um, and on most of these pen tests we see. Um, but there's a lot of lists out there. Seclus has a lot of great things if you want to check that out. Uh, I believe, I might botch his last name, but Daniel Meisler. Yeah, he basically uh, is one of the guys who basically runs the Seclus program. And it has a lot of great lists, whether you're doing fuzzing or password lists or even things with network intrusion it has. Um, and you can use this, and I like to use it with Burp's Intruder to do my brute force attempts. And you can also research your target and kind of get creepy and hackery. And you can use tools like Cool and create these like, custom word lists, or if you know that like Bob is the sysadmin, he's a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan, or you know, a Philadelphia Eagles fan. You could try and make variations of that you know, as the password and go from there. So from there, as you can see, with these different variables, if we can piece them all together, like the uh, username enumeration, the passwords are probably weak, and there's no lockout, we can eventually just keep knocking on the door until we get in. So as you gather these valid credentials and you get this account compromised, send it to a list in, of your own sorts and try it across a lot of different services. But try not to lock people out at the same time. It's hard. So if it's connected to Active Directory, a lot of times it will be lockouts. So keep that in mind as well. You can use other things besides Intruder if it's not application-based, like Hydra, CrackMap. Um, there's SMB modules with Metasploit. You can use NMAP, NSC scripts, and things of that nature to also do these brute force attempts. 
Um, always try default creds, as sad as it is. We had several pen tests recently where default creds are just rampant. And a lot of times they say, oh, it's the vendor's fault. It's not my fault. It's the vendor's fault. It's okay. I mean, it happens. But see, if you can enumerate the technology and the version, use that to your advantage because the creds will change over years. You know, we'll see that a lot. Um, and, and more and more vendors are starting to move away from default creds, which is good. They're just using a de default username, and then they're making you enter in a password a lot of times after and making you change it. Uh, commonly, we see a lot of shared group creds across Linux systems, and we'll see a lot of shared local admin accounts across the enterprise as well. So a lot of times people are trying to make things easy and just say, I can log into everything I want across my Windows environment with this one account. Well, if I get that, that's the holy grail, and it's game over. So that's the realistic perspective of what an attacker is looking for. So some final thoughts and tips. If you're doing any kind of external reconnaissance on anything on the Internet, um, use Shodan and Census. They both have free versions. Um, Shodan has a paid version as well, but essentially it's passive reconnaissance. You don't have to send a single packet to the organization. It's in a database. You can look at it and basically get an idea of what you're up against, whether it's an organization, firm, IP space, whatever it may be. And it can tell you a lot of things about port services and potential vulnerabilities, like even Heartbleed out there. Um, make sure you investigate shares. When you're internal, I like to use enum for Linux. It's simply just a Perl script that wraps enum.exe, and it gives you a lot of information about the shares, and it can also give you usernames, different things like that. The password complexity will tell you sometimes. It's pretty cool stuff. So check, check that one out in the lab environment if you can. Um, unlink content enumeration. Like Andrew said, it's a treasure chest. A lot of times developers will forget, or a lot of times people will think like, oh, okay, I blocked that down. It's definitely a 404 or a 403. There's no way it's on my server. Well, it happens. To the point where one time we were going against the server and we found a zip file with tons and tons and tons of resumes and I think also some PII. Service. Yeah, and they were like, holy crap, that's internet facing? I thought that was, and it's just because they downloaded it on their web server. And it just goes to show you, you don't think about it, but that's unlinked. It's not in the site map, but it's there. So use, you know, use your intruder and try and find that content. Um, Passwords written on sticky notes, like I said, yeah, usually this happens. It's human nature. We all do this. Lock it up, put it in a drawer, or if you can, I guess use one of those different things like LastPass or something of that nature if you're an advocate for it. Um, can you reset the password via the help desk? Good old social engineering. This is fun. If you ever can do it and you're doing pen testing, I love it. Um, it works sometimes. It doesn't work sometimes. Sometimes I have to hang up the phone halfway through or I just have to say, yeah, come see me at my desk. And... You know, then I have to tell the POC, uh, we're going to go find Joe and think that he just wants to reset his password. Exactly. I try. I try. Andrew, like, on, I can't do it on command, but I can do it in the moment. So I do. From the frog. From the frog here. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, can we put it? And then the other things we want to do is if it's an application or anything, and if it's custom or it's, you know, commercial or whatever, let's try to abuse features. There's a lot of different things. We have another talk called Beyond Automated Testing, which is all on external web pen testing. We've given it in other talks. And that one talks a lot about feature abuse and how we can abuse contact us forms and we can abuse, you know, different things of, of login features and just other different things of the norm you'll see on the web. And people are like, this is great. My users are going to love this. And then attackers are like, this is great. I can abuse it. So you'll find other things you can do with the technology. And you want to really look at the functionality it's trying to perform and figure out how can I misuse it. Um, and once again, if you get valid credentials, try them across everything, but try not to lock people out. So also keep that in mind. We see that a lot, like I said, with Active Directory, it'll, you know, have different rules in place where they'll say five bad attempts, you get locked out, and then, you know, people are freaking out. Here's some useful trainings and links. Um, we like to always just say, you know, if, you, if you're going after a certification, you want to learn something new, um, Cyberry is a great site you can go to. Um, they're local for us here in, in, well, in Maryland. Um, I think they're in Columbia, but we actually have some stuff on there as well. They reached out to, uh, I think, Andrew, and then we kind of got with them, and, and we created a couple session Wednesdays. Um, but they have a lot of cool stuff. Like if you're going after your CEH or your CISB or something of that nature, or you want to learn how to use, you know, Mimi Cats or something of that nature, they teach you, and it's all free. So check that out. Um, if you want to do some, you know, capture the flag events in your own time, um, Bone Hub, uh, Pen Tester Lab, past CTF write-ups out there, a lot of different things, those resources, and these are all hyperlinked, they're all slide share, so you don't have to jot them down. You can go and just click on them. 
Um, training, we personally like Offensive Security Sans. Security Tube's really good uh, with, with Vivek. He has a lot of good things like the pen testing Python course, and he has a PowerShell one as well. Um, books, there's the books. Talks, there's tons on Iron Geek's channel all the time. I think we're on it potentially filming right now. Uh, <laughs> and tons of great talks there. Um, and like I said, there's tons of great things on GitHub as well, like the sec list. And then there's even the security list for fun and profit, which is just a huge hub of just everything, InfoSec. So feel free to check all that out because, you know, we like to share with the community and always get better. And we don't know everything. And, you know, we always want to just evolve. So if you ever want to contact us, there you go. Um, we also gave our Twitter handles earlier. Um, and, you know, we are hiring at Breakpoint Labs right now uh, for a couple different positions. So if you're interested, feel free to let us know or just shoot us an email. But we thank you for your time, and hopefully you learned something and enjoyed it. Other than that, thanks, everybody. And if you have any questions, let us know. Hey guys, so there's been one question that's been going around and that is about these, the challenge coins. So if you want one of the challenge coins, uh, the people who have them are the sponsors. You walk next door to where they're doing the capture the flag and the wireless challenges, you can go through there and you can talk about it, but that's where they're at. We're not selling them. If you want one of the challenge coins, if you're one of the collectors, go over there, talk to the vendors, they uh, can hook you up. Thanks folks.